All right, Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and I have a special guest, Xavier D. Johnson with Hello. Enterprise Offensive Security. How's it we going? have to talk about this Windows DNS policy. I needed someone smart in cybersecurity to help me with this. Like, this yeah. Is, we, I, I, you know it's 10 out of 10 bad. We'll you hear that. things like wormable, and you're like, hold on. Hold yeah. on. Windows is starting to, starting to scare me a little bit here. But it may not be as bad as we think. Right? Well, I hope so. So I'm going to rely on a little expertise here. So that's why Xavier's here. I'll leave a link to uh, how you can find his channel information about him down below. Uh, but let's dive into this uh, mess that is the cigarette. I think that's what it's been called, right? Cigarette. Yeah, cigarette. And it's funny. I, I love the name of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, because if you understand the bug, then you understand the, uh, the severity of the name. Yes, and we'll start with what is SIGRED specifically calling to a signature record used in SIG0, RFC 2931, and Tiki, uh, blah, blah, blah. So mm -hmm. what we're looking at here is the signatures within DNS. So yep. you have a domain, that domain has name servers attached to it. And, you know, for example, lawrencesystems.com and then there's uh, ns.lawrencetechnology.com, I think, or NS1 is our name server. Now, if I were to craft a payload into my, because I control my name server, so I can put whatever I want in this particular right. slot, so to speak, in the DNS. And it turns out, if you put something big enough in there, Microsoft will think it's executable, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. It starts to uh, flow over into another part, another piece of memory that it shouldn't. And so it seems like you could just put a payload as a DNS record. Yeah, and that's not how it should work. You should always sanitize your input. So when you're reading something, especially out of the public space that is the internet where anyone can put anything in a record, right. um, proper coding, um, and someone wasn't thinking about this about 17 years ago when this book <laughs> <laughs> um, first got introduced. Yeah, it, it basically allows this in there. Now, I know some of you are going, well, good news, my Windows DNS server isn't publicly facing, so I should be safe. Um, but that's actually not true either. The exploit works by if you have a Windows uh, Active Directory set up and your hosts are all connected to that Active Directory, that pretty much means that Windows Server is acting as a DNS. So any one of your clients, no matter what level of protection they put on there, they send their queries over to your Microsoft server and then it reaches out and grabs the, well, what could be a payload in the name server right. record. And that's where the exploit problem comes in. Yeah. And uh, I mean, this is the reason why you, you would use SIG uh, to begin with is uh, to address the, the, it's a need for DNS sec as far as I yeah. know. Yes. So um, just imagine you're trying to, you're trying to, uh, you're trying to use security against security, right? So, I mean, it's not necessarily that the DNS of uh, Windows or Microsoft itself is vulnerable as much as it is the implementation of reading these records from the DNS. Yes. So the concept of DNSSEC was to establish like a better authority so we don't man in the middle something. So we have a secure line between making sure, all right, this name server is properly Tom's name server for his website. So we know that the name server and a website and it's all working together. We're going to deliver you validated records to make sure that this is the website you're going to. But of course, right. adding these extra signatures was the extra coding that meant we have to put signatures in there and right. we should... These are like essentially uh, security certificates that they put in there for Basically. validation. Yeah there's, a, yeah, there's a signature and there's a key. Yeah, and but there apparently is also the buffer overflow. So what they're right. doing here is, <laughs> <laughs> and how many times doing security research do, is this where you start poking and looking? <laughs> I mean, anytime you got input and output, that's when you're supposed to, that's where the rubber meets the road for security. And if you're an aspiring researcher, anytime, you figure out that a system is receiving data and or giving data, that's where, those are your sweet spots. So somebody thought about this and said, hmm, how is the domain actually handling DNS? I wonder if I can pass more data than what can be handled uh, in, that, in the runtime uh, when they're calling out the signature. And here you go, you get a, you get a, uh, a heat-based buffer overflow. And it first starts usually you the first thing that happens when you've overrun the data is it crashes but the crash right. is the first indicator into well it crash but sweet spot yeah let's keep fuzzing away at it until we find out where the executable is and that's how we can start delivering a payload into it and actually get the server to run something 
right? It's called control flow, right? And if you can get, con- if you can actually gain control over the flow of the runtime or the execution of a program, then you own the program, right? Because you're saying, hey, uh, by the way, go to this next memory address for your next instruction. And if I own that memory address, and I can actually send whatever instructions I like. <laughs> and that's where it gets scary because DNS is a server level function. So you get full system, you know, system. You're, you're running at the lowest, or, or I should say highest level uh, right. functionality in Windows. You know, the ring zero, lowest ring, ring highest level. zero. <laughs> yeah. And that's where you want to be because now you have control. So once you've decided to execute something, whatever you have executing there executes with that same level of permission that the DNS server runs at. And all right. this is being done, the user is completely unaware of it because it actually doesn't affect the user's workstation. It directly attaches to the server. It's executing at the server level, not the workstation level. Right. And that's where this really gets interesting, right? You're talking about a user a single user in your network, in your environment, being able to compromise the server upstream from it that actually affects the rest of the organization. So no longer are you worried about just a simple, you know, ransomware on a single endpoint that may be able to be contained to that single device, depending on how you have your network set up. You're talking about entire complete network compromise from the click of a link or just from visiting a page potentially. Yeah, and this is it's a really scary concept on there. I mean, attacking the DNS like this. Someone had asked me about why this is why this wasn't found earlier than 17 years. And there has been other exploits. I know Unbound I covered before, I think in another video where Unbound had a very similar one where they found out there was a buffer overrun um, under certain conditions, which good news is I don't think for most systems it was a default condition, but that in the Linux world was a similar problem where Unbound would read the same thing. It was DNSSEC signatures somewhere related in that area and someone found out an overflow. Because it is scary because the user goes, all I did was go to the website. And they, yeah. there's not even a trail left on the user other than if you have to know the website to deliver the payload. But um, I mean, often the hackers wor- leave that evidence for you. <laughs> I mean, in the world with malicious advertising and the fact that, you know, I could put a malicious ad onto a legitimate site and take advantage of this vulnerability just for you visiting the site and that DNS being resolved on your network. That's very, very dangerous. Yeah. So the checkpoint research did some really good. I mean, we're not going to go through every little bit of it, but um, you can tell I'm like halfway down the page. They walk you through each little piece of exactly how this is Mm -hmm. done, which I thought was great how they uh, break it down. it's really solid research, but it also goes to show something I brought up before is why it doesn't get fine for 17 years is also because this is how much work it was to find this. <laughs> right. And uh, there's definitely, there's definitely a few more of these bugs hanging out out there. Uh, just kind of waiting, waiting to be, to found. be uh, found. Yeah. So if you're They're called zero bug, days. Uh, and there. I mean, you know, you talk about the zero day thing, this is that. And who's to say that this hasn't been used in campaigns before where just people are being compromised from using this exact bug. Um, I can tell you this, there will be patches that uh, come out. There'll be some people that don't patch. They will be compromised due to this bug. Um, I mean, we just can guarantee you that a 10 out of 10 wormable Windows 10 uh, bug is going to be uh, uh, abused. Yeah, we're going to definitely see this use. Well, and the other side that's going to happen on this is um, because this is so old, this affects really old versions that are all well, long past support, long past patching, right. but obviously still in use. And uh, right. no one, no one's turning off that 2003 server because it works. Nope. So it's nope. just a matter Nobody's- of time for someone releases a series of, you know, ads or whatever they want to start, you know, blanketing out this and getting users to click on it. A couple of malicious, well placed ads to weird domains. I mean, you don't even really got to go that far if you got a Raspberry Pi and you can get somebody on your network and then do Captive Portal. Yeah then you just force someone's device to actually connect to a network and then force their device to, to send traffic to a place that may have this vulnerability. So uh, it become uh, patch. Patch. The, <laughs> the only answer for this is patch or don't use Windows DNS. Those are the only two yep. options. Now, another question yeah. to come up, I seen a few people had actually uh, asked me this was, well, why do they release this research and the patch? And the reason why is really simple. How many, how many bad actors are watching Patch Tuesday, which was yesterday? Or is that all yeah, yesterday was Patch Tuesday? Yesterday. Oh, all of them. All of them. So they would have found this anyways. They would have said, yeah. so making- I mean, and, and if you, 
and if you look at WinBindex, W-I-N-B-I-N-D-E-X, and you can pull this up if you want. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of this before, but Win, WinBindex is uh, a tool that allows you to be able to find all of the different binaries that were changed based on Windows updates. Wow. If you get, give it a go, if you want to share your window and uh, pull that up for the people. It's really interesting. I just discovered it about two days ago, and it's funny because literally a day before Patch Tuesday, um, and it's also funny, you, you actually shared a link, uh, is it patch Tuesday? And that was redirecting potentially at, at some point. I'm not sure why, but you talk about the ability to be able to get into traffic. Um, what's the domain again? Uh, win Ben Dex. Yep. B I N like B -I binary. Why am I spelling? Why am I thinking that? And there you go. Yep. That's it. So, I mean, I, I'm not, you know, the most uh, Windows friendly person, but I can tell you that, uh, you know, even if you want to click on that blog post down there, I can tell you that this will be used and is used for you to be able to, uh, to get a better understanding of what is coming out uh, of these updates, right? And so something like, you know, reverse engineering a patch, it's becoming wow. easier and easier and lower hanging fruit than ever. Um, like, and they're I using this. tools. This isn't my skill set. Like, <laughs> right. Right. Wow. Getting a list of updates, how they do it. This is, yeah, here's how you grab them. And then, okay, they have some pretty simple instructions. I'll have to check this site out. That's pretty neat. So, yeah. Uh, if you want to give that one file a look, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, SIG, uh, I can't think of the exact DLL. Oh, they have lists in here. Look, look at that. Just, ty just type in SIG and see what pops up. And then scroll down to the SS. Sig, sign in control, nothing yet. So it's probably a matter of time before you pop, type in SIG and either way. See stuff. But yeah, I mean, it's pretty powerful. You need to find something. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and, and when you can download the vulnerable version, just in case you want to have a backdoor back into some systems, right? Yeah. Um, oh, well, let me just replace this one DLL with this other DLL. And it's not like Windows is going to say, hey, by the way, that's a malicious malware. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to say, oh, that's a part the, of me. <laughs> yeah, if you're living off the land and just doing it that way and you're just I'm replacing some because you're replacing it with a known good, so it actually would pass signature. So if you were actually exactly. to uh, use it, I get the, I get what you're saying. You could actually unpatch a system, which is yes. actually super scary. <laughs> <laughs> if you unpatch a system, Microsoft may not realize a file was changed, so you gained access, Whoops. you unpatched it. I mean, it's harder to gain access if it's patched, but then you can further unpatch a system. So one patch leads to, let me unpatch a few more things. Yeah, especially <laughs> if I have like domain admin and I'm wow. doing stuff like pushing GPO, and I may come up with a nice whip do one-liner to make your entire network vulnerable by just replacing one single DLL, a part of my campaign, right? We're talking about advanced persistent threats. We're talking about targeted things. So maybe I'm in there for six months just trying to get you to, you know, just trying to get you to the holiday season so I can get you to the one page <laughs> to get domain admin, right? Or to, to further my access or whatever, right? Um, See, and and this is why I had you on here. This is what you do for a living. So you're, you, you go like those next layers deep. You're like, I've been in that for six months. <laughs> and, you, and to be full disclosure, Xavier spends time reversing this and undoing hacks that people right. have done. And, uh, I and mean, but I, I, I spin in both. I spin side on both sides of the coin, right? So yeah. I have some customers that come to me that are breached, hair on fire. And then uh, I have the majority of my customers come to me that have already been breached. And they're like, hey, I never want to go through that again. Can you please help me? And then we work with them to put together a plan so that they can keep an eye on, on things, right? Like there's no foolproof method to stopping, uh, you know, attackers or attacks, insider or external. But what you can do is develop a program, a security program within your organization that addresses these risks and then document the ways that you've addressed these risks and continue to make those living documents and say, hey, um, you know, as threats emerge, we're going to need to add on to these policies to make sure that we're accountable and that we're being held accountable for all of the, you know, the, the potential risks that are exposed. Right. I mean, something as simple as a proxy may be able to save you from a, a you know, a, a attack like this or the single one liner that can be run that, uh, you know, uh, sets the maximum size for DNS records. Yeah. <laughs> Little things like that. And I, I think the biggest thing is 
probably the the when you have done these security audits, almost always they're unpatched like from last year, not last week. So most of it is yes. there's the value in the security audit. It's not like you didn't patch from yesterday's patch Tuesday. It's like last year's patch Tuesday. Yeah, right. you skipped a few. Um, and I think right. that's what people. I, I I think the um there's a few every year they do those, you know, what got breached, like uh, overviews for a year. And most exploits were ones that were over, I think 50% of exploits are ones that are over a year old or the ones oh, that yeah. are used. So for sure. Yeah. I, a lot of my, a lot, I mean, 2000 exploits from 2014 are, are still, still being valid. Used. Um, and then you also got to think about like beyond exploits, right. As a security practitioner, as a red teamer, right. I get to do things that aren't necessarily just find a service and exploit it. I get to move laterally. Right. So there's a, there's some times where you'll make one compromise and then a misconfiguration is the way that I'll get domain admin. Right. <laughs> and so like uh, you may have had that one week service or you may have had that one person that clicked on the link. And when I got on their host, the rest of your network was flat. You didn't use MFA to your services. You didn't proxy off all of your sensitive things. I was able to go from, you know, east to west very easily. Yeah, that lateral movement's important because I know there's a lot of companies that the lateral movement becomes easy, and this is something we've helped is because of the flat network problem. They go, well, it's behind a firewall, so it's okay that we have a 2003 server. I'm like, mm. no, you need to segment that off to yet another one so your general users that don't need access to it, which is usually you're running it because you have some particular piece of software, but that whole software and that whole thing should all be in its own container. That way, if uh, the general person in accounting clicks on something, you don't get that lateral movement. This is, it's right. still, there's ways to protect against it. So it is doom and gloom in terms of this particular bug we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But if you have an overall security plan exactly. um, to help prevent some of that, you know, East West movement, your life's going to be a lot better. So. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I've had customers that have had ransomware events where one endpoint got ransomed and I'm like, Bravo. And they're yeah. like, yeah, by the way, we got, you know, iDrive and we got these other ways for us to be able to look at when files get changed and we audit this and, you know, so, yeah. and, and they still had things that they could have done better and can still do better. And that's how they get to that next level of hardening where they're like, Hey, we survived and uh, uh, what, what our competitors may die from. Right. Yeah. Um, and so it, it validates the spend on security at that point. And sometimes that's what it takes. Uh, is for you to go through a breach and actually see that the things that you're doing is are working, right? Um, like when Tom lets me on his network and I start pinging around and then he goes, <laughs> hey, uh, I got ARP watch on. So I see what you're doing. And yep. <laughs> also, I got, I got Tor block. So what was happening, right? Uh, you know, those little small pieces slow a person like me down. I'm like, forget Tom's rack. I want to go find Steve's computer because I know Steve has like some special VPN that'll let me do other stuff. <laughs> it is kind of fun. And this is why, you know, so much of what I've talked about on my channel is a lot of that. And Xavier talks about the other side, the tooling side on his channel. So I'll leave links where you can find out more about uh, Xavier and his, in his company and things like that. And of course, links to the code red and the bottom line. And in, in, if you're looking for what the immediate thing to do is patch, and once you're done patching, because if you, you don't even finish this video, if you're not patched, <laughs> get that done. <laughs> once you're done right. with that, start talking about security plans, start putting some thoughts on it and segment your network and be safe out there, man. It's a, it's a scary world. So we're going to get back to work though. Yes. <laughs> patching and, uh, I got new work. hardware that I'm playing with. <laughs> yep. Yep. We got some new lab builds. So you're going to be start seeing a lot more from Xavier. Um, yep. I'm help, that's what me and him are going to be back doing too, is we have the, I see all those new servers in the back there. So we're going to start working on all that. <laughs> Shiny. All right. Thanks. Thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.